Uh, my name is Luke Upchurch, and I'm delighted to have you with us here today. Uh, this is an opportunity for our members, uh, our supporters, uh, anyone interested in consumer rights to put questions to those at the very top of the global consumer rights movement. And that's why I'm delighted to have here today CI President and CEO of Consumer Reports, Jim Guest, and also with us, uh, Consumers International's Director General, Helen McCullum. Hi. Now, we've had a tremendous response already to this, uh, this webinar. We've had questions from all over the world, uh, sent in via email from, on Facebook and, and Twitter. And we're going to touch on as many of those issues as, as we can in the next 40 minutes. Um, you can also still pose a question during the webinar using the, uh, the Q&A box that you should be able to see in front of, in front of you if you're, if you're watching this live. So please do try and ask some questions there. And again, we'll try and touch on as many of those issues as, as we can this time around. So I'm going to kick off straight away um, with, with Jim. Um, this is a very challenging time for consumers uh, for many, many different reasons. There's a lot of challenges that they're facing. CI, CI has just released its new strategy up until 2015. Can you explain to me how that deals with some of these challenges that consumers are facing? Sure. And, and the basic thing is that uh, Consumers International, which has now been around for 52 years, is out to protect consumer rights in all parts of the world. And it's especially timely because this is the 50-year anniversary, as many of our members know, of the Declaration of Consumer Rights by President Kennedy back in 1962. So in all the different fields that we're doing, basically, you know, when you look at consumers, you know, our, our, our money speaks. You know, for consumers, businesses are happy to take our money, but so often our voice is not heard. And really what we're doing collectively with the 240 members from around the world is speaking as the global voice for consumers in front of the various bodies, the UN bodies and the other bodies that issue standards and guidelines and so forth, we have, as you know, special status so that we are the voice or of consumers in those situations. So what are we working on now? I mean, issues like food safety and nutrition, issues like access to financial services and getting fair financial services, looking at consumer justice. Some, some countries have good, strong laws that aren't being carried out. Other countries are still working on laws. Uh, I think um, Helen can talk a little bit about what we're doing on sustainable consumption, for example. But in all of these areas, basically, whether you're from a developing country or, or a developed country, whether you're large or whether you're small, and things like food safety and access to public services and, and financial services and access to all of that, in one way or another, consumers in every single country of the world are getting taken advantage of in many cases, in some cases certainly by powerful corporate interests. And so our job is to fight for the rights of consumers, protect consumers, uh, so that um, we are in fact the powerful body in all parts of the world. And the other thing that we're doing, and uh, this again has been really a, a major focus for Helen McCallum who came in a year ago as Director General, what can we be doing to help empower the local organizations that are members of, of Consumers, Consumers International? Yeah. So that's all part of what we're doing as well. And supporting the work, whether it's their advocacy on local issues or their being part of the international advocacy, this is all part of the strategy going forward. There's a lot of issues that you've touched on there. Um, I just want to pick up on a couple of them, which I, I know sure. are coming in as questions from, from members and supporters. And maybe if I can turn to Helen, um, just to look specifically at sustainable consumption. The reason I ra raise that is um, we have the Rio Plus 20 event in a couple of weeks, a major occasion for, uh, for the world looking at sustainable development. Many of our members are wanting to know what we're doing on sustainable consumption because it's not something they see prominently yeah. in some of the new priority areas that we're working sure. on. Can you explain yeah. a bit of that? Absolutely. Well, we've got a program running towards Rio. Um, Luis Flores in our Latin America office is leading the delegation there and Jayok Kim, who is the Vice President of Consumers International, will be part of that delegation. Um, what we're calling for there is firstly an international body on sustainable consumption um, that actually you know, can really make uh, significant changes and significant support for consumer organisations and consumers. Um, we're also calling for programmes to be incorporated in the 10-year framework programs that consumer organizations can subsequently use um, uh, to help develop programs within their own countries. So two, call, two major calls towards the Rio, Rio summit. Um, what we plan to do after the summit is to have another look at the whole area of sustainability and determine you know, just where Consumers International can make the maximum impact. What's the most important thing for our members within that sort of territory? And we'll be discussing that through the council and the executive uh, to, to decide on a programme going forward. 
Okay, that's great. I, I'm, I'm going to come back to some of the, uh, the, the issues, the consumer rights issues that, that uh, the CI is looking to work on. But um, one, I want to move more to um, what it means to be a CI member. Um, one of the questions that's coming through a lot, and I'll, I'll speak to you about this, Jim, um, is the relationship between a consumer organization and the corporate sector, the relationship between CI members and businesses. How does that work? What are the, what are the lines in the sand, as far as you're concerned, in that type of relationship? Well, first of all, what we're trying to do at Consumers International generally and, and local uh, member organizations in their, in their countries is to influence how business behaves in the marketplace to make it a more fair, just, and safe marketplace for consumers. So we are, not only do we lobby for legislation and consumer protections and setting standards, and not only do we lobby regulatory bodies to be sure that consumer protections are there, but often we will work with businesses or or with at however you want to describe it, um, where we're trying to persuade them to change what they're doing. If we can't persuade them to change what they're doing, then we'll go to a, a regulatory or, or legal action. So we're certainly relating to business and following what business is doing and having meetings trying to persuade business to act in a, in a pro-consumer way in the marketplace. But there's the other aspect of it, and this is one of the things that really gives CI credibility with the international bodies where we lobby and credibility within our own countries is we're not bought by business. We don't take money from business. We don't take advertising. We are independent. We have only one interest and only one constituency that we represent and that's the interest of consumers and that's been one of the, been one of the great strengths of this organization and its members that people know that when a member speaks, when CI, CI speaks, there's not some hidden agenda. I mean, one of the things that happens, e even in my own country, there are so-called consumer organizations working on, say, health issues. They're funded by the drug companies. Is that really going to be an independent, believable, credible consumer voice? The answer is no. So that's why we are really careful to avoid any reality or perception that there's a conflict of interest beyond representing consumers. Okay, that's interesting. I'd, I'd, I'd like to yeah. touch again with, with Helen on, you know, if we take that as a, a given, that there, is a, there needs to be this, this, this uh, distinction between advertising business interests and, and the consumer organization, many of our members, many of organizations that want to look to be CI members um, already have a relationship of some kind uh, uh, in an advertising uh, capacity. Um, if they can't go down that route, what can they do? What kind of business models uh, can they look at uh, to, to make them a sustainable organisation? Well, I can't give you a comprehensive answer, obviously. This is quite a big issue, but, uh, but it is, I'll just touch on a couple of things because there are a number of organisations, um, many of them in Europe, but not exclusively in Europe, um, who are beginning to develop services to consumers that are, if you like, it, that are, that are industry-facing and that bring some sort of revenue, uh, but, but, but the operation is completely in, independent in the sense, so let me give you one example. Um, energy auctions would be one example, and a number of our members, and which, is a, which has just done this very recently, are gathering consumers who want to make a change in their energy supplier and holding an auction with the en energy companies uh, to make the best offer to those consumers. Um, there is, a, there is you know, a return to the consumer organisation from that exercise, but there is absolutely no possibility that that could be viewed as something uh, where the energy supplier could influence either consumers or the consumer bodies. So there are ideas around, and one of the things we're keen to do is actually take a harder look at those ideas, try and gather them together, actually, and, and perhaps make those more available to other consumer organisations so people can start picking each other's brains um, and thinking about ways of achieving revenue streams that still retain that all critical, absolutely critical principle of independence. Sure. Sure. But you know, actually, Helen, it was an interesting what you described, Helen, in terms of collective power. Yeah. Uh, individual consumers can't really influence the prices or the availability, the quality of what they're getting. But collectively together, organized by one of the members or many of the members of CI, collectively together, there is that purchasing power or that influencing power. And then again, there's the notion of the collective power of 240 consumer organizations from 115 countries. That is really powerful. So while separately we may have, as consumers or organizations, difficulty looking out for ourselves, collectively, collectively we can make a major impact. 
Okay, that's great. Um, uh, we're going to uh, try and address one of the uh, questions coming in through the webinar, um, which is again looking at the issues that we're working on. And this is from uh, Malwani uh, from, from Uganda, who's, uh, who's, who's, who's praised the work that CI is doing on financial uh, institutions. Um, but wonders how far the advocacy work can actually go. What is going to be the bottom line for consumers living in countries where governments are only protecting the rich? Um, uh, Helen, maybe there's, there's something you can kind of mention for, for that, and, and Jim, if you want to sure. respond as well. Sure. Um, well, obviously, you'll be aware that the advocacy work we're doing is headed towards G20 at the moment to try to achieve some international guidelines and standards that can be applied uh, at national level right across the world. So although it's the G20 we're talking to, you know, this what we're seeking is something that is applicable to the whole world and all consumers everywhere. Of course, international standards is step one. <laughs> After that, we've got to make sure that they get, you know, they get used in, 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 country, in individual countries and that that has an impact on, on consumers. So, so it does feel like you know, step one, step two, step seven, and we've got a long way to go. Um, however, we're also trying to do some work and find funding to support consumer organisations individually in their areas. In particular, for example, in Africa, we've run a project just recently on financial education, reaching out to rural Africans, helping them with you know, real, um, real sort of financial planning or you know, planning how to deal with their money, even if they haven't got very much. Um, and we're really hopeful that we'll be able to roll that forwards elsewhere. So that would be one thing. We're also looking at other issues like mobile banking, for example, and access to basic bank account, which is relevant to other parts of the world. So, so our programme on financial services is you know, in part advocacy, but also um, projects that are really trying to tackle the on-the-ground issues too. Jim, if I could yeah. ask you as well. Um, sure. uh, Consumer Reports has done a huge amount of work on, on financial issues here in, in the United States. Um, are there kind of any lessons that you could, uh, you could impart on, on other consumer organizations, large or small, from the global north or the global south, from some of the experiences that uh, Consumer Reports have had? Well, let me mention a couple of things. Actually, you recall that on World Consumer Rights Day, back on March 15th, one of the issues that's of, of great concern in many countries around the world, not all uh, consumer members, uh, CI members, is remittances. And, and uh, we just recently did at Consumer Reports a major article sort of blowing the cover off the abuses in, in, the, in the area of remittances and advice for consumers as to how they can either if they're sending remittances, receiving remittances, how they can try to get greater protections. So there's, there's information like that and, and from some of the other organizations, members, that either is posted or can be posted, uh, look on the website and that would be useful. But I guess the general point that I, 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 I make, and, and there are abuses and consumers in developing countries are getting abused as consumers in developed countries and developed and developing countries both, mm -hmm. is basically my, my sort of credo as a consumer advocate is don't take no for an answer. <laughs> I mean the fact is if you fight and fight and fight and organize and mobilize consumers and put pressure on, yes the banks and the financial institutions and other corporations have a huge amount of money and they are spending that money on advertising and marketing practices that are not in the consumer interest. They're spending it to influence political decisions and governments and so forth. So the person who asked that question, he's right. There's lots of money on the other side, but what we have is people. And, and, and really what, what, what CI can do is to itself and with its member organizations, organize the people power. Things aren't gonna change overnight. But look at the difference now. When we started, when CI started 52 years ago, there were just a handful, if that, consumer organizations, say, in Latin America or in Asia or in Africa. Now there are dozens of organizations in all regions. And yes, many are struggling, but they're, they're fighting and they're not taking no for an answer. So I guess that's my more general lesson. Fight, 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 yeah. and, and, and we have made progress and we'll keep making progress. There's a lot of issues that we've raised there, so I just want to kind of touch on a couple of ones which um, um, I've certainly seen have come through uh, in questions from, from members and, and supporters. Um, most notably, maybe back to Helen on this, um, what does CI do to get this information across? Uh, Jim mentioned you know, putting, putting materials on, on the website, but sure. how, can, how can consumer organizations get hold of this vital information um, through Consumers International? Well, we have, as, uh, you know, we have blogs. 
Um, we have Facebook pages. Uh, we have, oh, you can tweet. <laughs> um, and, and obviously, we have member alerts and newsletters, regular newsletters. So there are a whole raft of different communications methodologies that we use to try and make sure that, can, can, that, that consumer organizations can pick each other's brains, really, can learn things that other people in other parts of the world are doing uh, that might be relevant to what they're trying to achieve. So, so keep tuned to all those communications channels because we're really trying to improve them. We're really trying to make sure that the communications and the, the materials that we send out, both through the website and other means, are you know, much more regular, much more visible. But we're also going to launch uh, a, a sort of new initiative to try and gather together uh, a lot of the, the asset, if you like, the toolkits, the publications, the knowledge that we have in Consumers International, and some of which is vested in our members, and actually create a sort of place on the website where you can almost search for what you're looking for and draw it out. Not there yet, but that's one of our ambitions. That's what we would like to try to do, to make sure that we do use all the knowledge and expertise that we've got around the globe, which is huge. But just one other thing, right now, before all that becomes a library, um, the opportunity for members is to look at our website, check out where other members are, and, and literally go directly to them and ask them <laughs> if, they are, you know, if there's material that they've spotted that they think would be helpful to them. So it's, it's about mem helping members to help themselves. Sure, yeah. Um, you know, this, this, for me, gets to the, to, the, to the real crux of the issue for CI. Um, a global membership, 240 organizations, 115 countries, so many different priorities amongst those organizations. Jim, with our new strategy, um, looking forward to 2015, um, you know, the strategic thinking that CI has done, how does it cater for such a large, diverse group? How do, how do we make sure that what we're doing um, um, helps and, and facilitates campaigning in the global north with developing countries, um, and, or developed countries, and with developing countries? How do we strike that balance? Well, again, it's being, it's being flexible, but as I mentioned earlier, the kinds of issues that CI is working on, whether it's in the area of food or financial services or consumer justice or sustainable consumption or, or digital access and privacy, these are issues that affect consumers everywhere. Now, the key thing is uh, what may be a concern about public services in the United States would have a quite different uh, picture in a, in, a developing, in a developing country, but they're there. And, and one of the nice things, just picking up what Helen just talked about, is member organizations in one part of the world are working on, say, getting access to clean water. In other parts of the world, our member organizations have a concern about that. They can trade. They can trade their research. They can trade their marketing, uh, their, 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 their advocacy campaigns. They can, they can trade how they're finding ways to be successful with government agencies or influencing industry. So, uh, the issues really are universal. The particular aspect of it that needs to happen is something that, that CI can help connect people working on like things. And, and that's one of, the real, one, one, one of the real powers. And in terms of going forward and, and under the strategy, the way that CI and, and the council, the council is 15 members elected from different regions uh, around the world. The council will be working on later this year what are the key programs? What are the key areas to focus on that are going to be of benefit going forward? The criteria include what are members across the board interested in? Mm -hmm. you know, so we want to pick issues that they're interested in. Do we have the, the, not only the member interest, but sort of the resources and the expertise that can help? Uh, and do we feel that collectively CI can make a difference? So there's a lot more, and I really appreciate this, Helen, the way that you've been running CI since you came as as Director General, a lot more communication back and forth and seeking input from, from the members, yeah. and, and that is especially important and powerful. Yeah. It's, yeah. I, I actually think it is, really, it is really important that we stay absolutely up to speed with what is critical to our members. The other thing I'd say, though, also, is that in the past, I think it's been true that CI has been criticized for trying to do everything and doing nothing well. <laughs> and so what we are trying to do is choose the most important issues to members right now and work on those and actually try and achieve something. It doesn't mean that if there's another topic that somebody is particularly keen that we work on at international level, we won't eventually. I think it's not just our country where we say, if you want to eat an elephant, you have to eat it a bite at a time. Um, so you know, it's about doing something 
really, you know, really chewing over it, really getting a, a result, and then find, you know, then picking another topic. So, so if your favourite topic isn't in our top five right now, it doesn't mean it never will be. It just means that we're going to try and achieve some advance there, and then move on to the next issue. It's, it's a tricky balancing act, yeah. I think. Um, and I, I want to kind of focus down on, on, a, on, a, on an issue which has come up a, 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 a great deal in, in over the years and we've had a lot of questions about. So I want to make sure that we, we deal with it head on and that's the issue of what CI is doing in Africa. Um, so you know, we've, we've talked about having to cater for different member needs, different member um, uh, priorities. Africa has a whole set of its own needs, a whole set of its own priorities. We've got a lot of member organisations there. Jim, during your presidency, yeah. what is your vision for it? What are we doing in Africa? Well, I'm glad to say that we are really now re-establishing in a strong, stronger way CI's presence in Africa and work with the members in Africa. Because I think you're right, it, um, it, 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 it faded for a period of time there. And, and I, as president and the council, has said to Helen, when you came in a year ago, we really want to re-establish a strong presence and assistance uh, to the consumer movement in Africa. So. It is clearly a high priority for, for me as president uh, and for the council. And Helen, you can talk about some of the things that, that you've been doing to carry out what is a clear mandate, but also yeah. a clear interest for you and the secretariat. Absolutely, yes. I mean, it, you know, it's such an important part of the world. Um, and the consumer need there is so significant that we really need to mobilize there. Um, what we've done uh, since last year when I arrived at CI is establish a, a physical presence in Africa again, because for a little while we didn't have a physical office and that was a disadvantage. So we now have opened an office in Pretoria. Um, we have two permanent staff already there. and. Zavarine and Kathy are working hard to make sure that they reconnect with members and listen to what members are really feeling is important to them in Africa. Um, we've also just appointed, literally just appointed, a new head of the office who will be arriving in post uh, um, midway through September. So that should strengthen the office again. The person we've appointed has a background in fundraising, um, really knows a lot of international fundraising bodies as well as African ones. So I'm, I'm you know, I think she's going to really help drive the thing forward. There's a, there's a really good sign. Since we did all that, um, we actually have negotiated uh, a longer term deal with OSI in South Africa, OSISA, um, who are very keen to support us. And we are making approaches to other African donor bodies, ACBF being one of the most significant. So, so I think, although we've got a long way to go, and I wouldn't pretend that we have got absolutely everything sorted, you know, we really do feel that we're beginning now to make some progress. And I hope that members will soon see that there is a real commitment to doing something and helping and supporting them in Africa. Okay, we're going to take a couple more questions from the webinar. People are still sending in lots of questions. Uh, a really nice question here from uh, Michael Gowis Webb. Um, how can CI seek to convince the donor community to prioritise consumer issues? Something we really need, are working on and, and really um, need to, 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 to get right. So, uh, Helen, is that something you can enlighten yeah, us with? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're really looking hard at our fundraising strategy, thinking about which donors to approach with, with which programs. It's helping us a lot that we have clear programs because we can actually talk to donors and match our approaches to donors who are really interested in, those, in that sort of work. So financial education in Africa, for example, there are some very specific donors who would be interested in supporting that. So trying to get our pitch right would be one of the things that we're, that we're trying to do. Um, but, we, uh, but I think we're also really sort of thinking hard about um, whether there are different sorts of donors that we've never approached before that we might be able to tackle. And we're having a look at individual donors, for example, <laughs> bluntly put, rich people who actually want to, to commit to helping people and can be convinced that the consumer, the consumer movement and helping citizens and consumers is what they really want to put their money into. So, um, so we're, we're really thinking hard about all this. Um, and the, the trick in all fundraising is to align what you want to do with what the donor wants to give to. And so making quite sure that, our, that when, we, when we pitch our consumer rights agenda, you know, we are meeting, uh, we're, we're, we're pitching it in a way that donars understand and are keen to, keen to support. Okay. 
Uh, Jim, we, we've, got a, we've got a question from Buenos Aires in Argentina, uh, again through the, the webinar. Um, they're looking forward to working on the initiatives within the 2015 strategic plan, but they, they want to know what um, CI uh, is doing in terms of legal protection and, 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 and consumer empowerment. Uh, how are those issues being reflected in the work we're doing? And, and how would, how would uh, we look to help uh, members in Latin America? I mean, I, I guess it's a question about how we'd help to help members in any region. Sure. Um, well, a, a couple of things, and, and actually, as uh, most members know, but maybe not all members, uh, CI has four offices. We've got the, the, uh, the global, the world office in London. Uh, then we have regional offices for Asia, Pacific, and the Middle East in Kuala Lumpur, uh, in Malaysia. In, uh, in Santiago, we have the office for Latin America and the Caribbean. And now in, uh, in Pretoria, the, yeah. the office for, for Africa. And those regional offices uh, are close, they're the ones who are, cl who are closest to the member organizations, work with them a lot, gather information that goes into the overall strategic plan as well. So to take Latin America in particular, there's, there's a, a good strong office down there. Uh, they've organized a number of things. They've done some research. I remember seeing a, a research study of, uh, of the banking community and in, in six or eight of the Latin American countries and how they were engaging in practices in Latin America that were illegal in Europe, for example. Um, so it can be working together on research. In some cases, uh, Helen was just talking about money that gets raised and grants that get raised. In some cases, there can be there are grants for programs in a particular region and some member organizations participate in that. So it's a combination. And, and then again, uh, the question talked about specifically, I think, some of the consumer justice or consumer protection things. Now, in most countries in Latin America, they have, in fact, passed. They've gotten the legislatures to pass consumer protection legislation. Some is getting carried out more strongly than others. Um, and, uh, and then in other parts of the world, uh, they're not even, they don't even have the consumer protections. There's a program going on in Malawi and Mozambique and Zambia, for example, to get a law passed through in the, in the first place. So whether it's in the Latin American region or the other regions of, of, uh, of CI, it's kind of collectively working together. And again, it's, it's what you had talked about, about gathering information in, sort of collecting information in from members and asking members how collectively can they best be served by what CI is mm. doing, mm. and then through the regional office and then through the global work uh, doing that. And then finally, I'm thinking of something like, uh, you recall one of the CI successes in the last couple of years was with the WHO um, getting, getting guidelines adopted uh, to restrict uh, marketing of junk food to kids. I mean, one uh, abusive uh, practice ar around the world. Well, CI now has prepared a, a sort of a, a toolkit of, um, of ways that member organizations in their countries and regionally can, can try to get those, those standards or those guidelines adopted. So again, CI can provide information that can be used sort of in different parts of the world by yeah. member organizations. So it's, it, it, it's a back and forth process. Yeah. Um, but what I really like is I, I see, and I gotta commend you for this, Helen, I see, the, I see the main office in London as well as the regional offices listening more than ever as I see it to members and being responsive. Um, now it's not that CI has a lot of resources, but it's got, <laughs> it's got, it's got people resources and the ability again to connect maybe folks in Latin America with some folks who are working in Asia Pacific yeah. on similar issues. So it all, it all kind of flows together. A, a, a bit of a follow-up question to that, yeah. maybe directed to Helen. Um, you know, th th this is a, there is, we, we're an international organization. Sure. We've got yeah. to work in more than one language. <coughs> now, there's obviously resource issues there. Yep. We do have a, a Spanish-speaking uh, uh, website. Um, we try to produce materials in, in, in French as well. But Tell, talk, talk to me about that challenge. Um, how, how difficult is it to, to campaign in three languages all at once? Well, it is quite a challenge, but um, uh, the great benefit of having an office in Latin America who speaks Spanish <laughs> is that we do have a strong CI, CI contingent, if you like, who can speak in that language and who can advocate in that language and indeed who can publish in that language. So um, French, I think, actually, we do find a slightly more of a challenge because we don't have a a sort of French office. Um, what we have done though is make sure, for example, that in Africa, where there is a significant um, French speaking contingent of members, um, we have appointed somebody who is a bilingual French speaker. So, Zav
Savarine speaks, speaks fluent French. Um, and we do also try to make sure that we have, um, we have those languages represented in each of our offices so, uh, so we can communicate with our members. You know, so I quite often receive <laughs> lots of communications in a variety of languages and I need to call on other people to help me uh, translate them and understand them. So, um, so we try to make sure that we are, you know, we are fully functioning in the three languages. There's a little bit of a challenge always with just how much do we translate everything um, because actually that's quite costly. So we try to translate the critical things, but I would say that if any member feels that there is you know, a particular publication or a document or a piece of information that they critically need in their language, then they should let us know and we'll see if we can, if we can accommodate that request. Okay. I want to get back um, to, to some of the issues. Um, now, one of the reasons that we're, uh, um, we've, we've decided to take on this webinar and one of the reasons that um, you know, we, we've been in, a, in the United States all, all this week celebrating uh, the 50th anniversary year of uh, President Kennedy's uh, message on consumer rights, where he, he outlined for the first time what consumer rights are. Um, and that's been the backbone and the principles for, for many consumer organizations around the world. Jim, I'd like to ask you, um, how relevant are those rights still today? Um, and you know, how are they being addressed by consumer organizations? Well, the rights are as relevant today as they were in 1962 when President Kennedy issued for a declaration of four consumer rights. That's been expanded through work by CI and, and the UN into eight rights. And just listing the rights, you can tell, yeah, what's the first one? The right to safety, absolutely crucial today. The right to be informed the right to choose, the right to be heard, the right to consumer education, the right to redress, the right to um, uh, satisfaction of basic uh, human needs, and the right to a healthy environment. Brilliant. Got every, them all. Single, <laughs> every single one of those eight rights is, is relevant today. Now, what are the threats to those rights? And the threats in different parts of the world can vary, but the fundamental basic rights are absolutely there. And uh, so what the, the, the challenge for CI, or the job of CI, is to see, okay, what are the greatest threats and dangers to those rights today yeah. in different parts of the world? Uh, what can we be doing to address those rights and helping member organizations to keep those rights front and center? Uh, and, and our job, again, you know, is basically protecting and being sure that consumer rights are not ignored. When I, when I sort of look to the vision for consumer rights in the, in the future, it's that, it's that people will have the ability to choose to make informed choices among products and services that are safe and effective and sustainable and to be sure that their rights both individually and collectively are protected and preserved and that in a sense is that's what we're all about in this movement and 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 we're needed as much as ever okay. we're going to take another uh, webinar question now this one from lisa gunn uh, of edec in brazil um, can we develop coordinated research on bank practices to include in the CI rankings of international banks? So I guess this is a, this is a question about how we can collaborate as organizations. Uh, mm. Helen, is there something you can touch on? Yeah, I'd just touch on that because actually that sort of thought has, has already occurred to Justin McMullen, who's the head of campaigns, and he's actively talking to um, the ICRT, which is the International Consumer Research and Testing Body, to see if we can uh, do a piece of research that actually makes a, compar a comparison across the world um, in financial services and in, in, in banks in particular. So it's something that we are actually having a look at. And Lisa, um, you know, I'd suggest that maybe you could connect, email Justin and ask him for a little more detail on where he's getting to with that. But we're, we're, we're actively thinking about it. Okay. And that, that is a, a really important issue for, for, for consumer organizations and consumer members is, is how we use each other's strengths, how we, how we kind of coordinate work between us. Um, when we do, we do that on a, on a number of issues. Um, how, how important do you think that is for, for global advocacy work, Jim? How important is the... The coordination the, of oh, member oh, organizations. Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, that, that's the core. I mean, that's part of what CI brings to the table that nobody else can do. Part of what I mentioned before is that we are accredited at high levels with various international bodies that set standards or adopt standards and so forth. So we are. We are the only recognized voice on, on any number of issues that, that come along. So that's one part of what CI brings to the table. But the other part, and we've talked about it earlier, is the ability to be a collective voice, and not only a collective voice, but a, a collective empowerer of member organizations so that not only on the issues that, um, that, that CI is working on with international bodies, but to help 
member organizations be as effective as they can be as advocates in their own countries on issues that may be local issues. So while there are some overall global major issues we've talked about, food and, 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 uh, and, and financial services and, and uh, privacy more and more in the digital age and things like that, there are other issues that are local that are not something that CI directly is working on, but by virtue of somebody being a member of CI and engaged in CI, uh, it helps strengthen their ability to be effective advocates locally and nationally. So that's the other aspect of, of what I think is unique and incredibly valuable and more important today than ever. Can I just add something to that? Because uh, um, because we've been here in Washington, and actually we've been um, we've been looking again at the G20 program at the moment because um, because we've been addressing the Mexican uh, the Mexicans and the next G20 presidency is in Mexico. And I just learned I think I knew, but there's a there's just a little story that might be illustrative that that when we were first starting to launch this campaign, um, the G20 was, summit was coming up. It was actually at that time in Korea. Um, and the reason we managed to get onto the agenda at incredibly short notice, you know, when there are so many things that they have to put on their agenda, is because Jayok Kim, who's uh, our con from Consumers Korea, knew the president and actually asked him to put this on the agenda. So that's, a, that's an illustration of how CI works with and through its members. The members are critical to our success. And I think CI can help coordinate once, you know, but, but we need that that input from our members we need that our engagement from our members so i would urge members to get engaged in you know the, the programs and the campaigns we're running and you know we don't know actually always just who you know and it's really really important that we find out <laughs> okay i'm gonna uh, go to a question that came in from uh, from peter darb of uh, the free consumers association in the netherlands um he wanted to know what was the vision towards the future of consumer organizations consumer education and especially the role of consumer participation. So looking forward, uh, Helen, if I can take the, put this to you. Okay. Looking forward, um, you know, how, does, how, does, how do you see, how does Consumers International see these crucial elements of consumer rights issues? Yeah, I think there is a real challenge always for consumer organisations. The economic circumstances at the moment are not great and many of us are finding it really quite difficult. So I think we have to really think hard about how we mobilize together. And actually, almost sometimes, we might want to think of different models of the way that we manage consumer organizations in certain parts of the world. So I think it's about really thinking about the climate we're in and how to operate most effectively. So that would be one thing. And the other things that challenge us, I guess, uh, but also offer us massive opportunities are the development, digital developments, communications developments. You, you think about all the things that we now have at our disposal um, so in, through social media media and so on, um, and the differences that have been made across the world by ordinary citizens mobilizing for using social media, you know, that's the sort of campaigning that we might be able to, to do more of and think more and harder about. So I think it's about, it's about grouping, regrouping, if you like, and mobilizing and, and making sure that we're using the technologies and the, and the modern um, tools that are available to us. So that would be something. Consumer education is obviously a, a key part of everything. I mean, consumer education is really important. It's not the only answer, as sometimes industry would like to suggest. You know, if the consumers were just educated, everything would be fine. Um, but consumer education, nevertheless, is an important thing. We do want young people to know that they have rights and be able to exercise them. Um, so we work with other international bodies like Pearl, for example, which are consumer education bodies, to try and um, try and help meet that agenda. So, um, so I think there's a there's there's a really strong future. We're never going to be out of a job, as, as Jim says. <laughs> you know, the consumer rights that were articulated 50 years ago are still needed to be articulated right now. So, uh, so it's about really taking the opportunities that present themselves to us and, and making sure that we stay, you know, thinking laterally about how we can make a difference to people all across the world. You know, as I was listening to that, Luke, I, I, I'm thinking there are two major aspects of what CI does. There is the, the consumer advocacy, both on the international stage and then on the national stage by its members. There's consumer advocacy. And the other key part of what Consumers International is doing in support of advocacy, both, both internationally and, and locally, the other aspect is the sort of empowering member organizations, sort of organizational empowerment. And those are the two major things, all geared towards, if you wanted to sort of sum up in a, in a, in a, in a short way, what we're all about as far as consumers. It, it's your rights as consumers. It's our mission as Consumers International. Your rights, our mission, and that's what we're about. 
Fantastic. Um, we are running out of time. If we didn't get a question answered from, from, from you, uh, I apologize for that. We, we will try and uh, answer some of these offline um, as we can over the next couple of weeks. Um, this has been a fantastic occasion. I'd like to thank Helen. Helen I'd like to thank Jim. Um, we will try and do again. I, I hope you can join us next time. We'd just like to play you out with a, a, a little film of uh, what CI is about, uh, give you a flavor of, of some of the issues that we've been working on. Thanks very much for joining us. was tridimorph, which can cause birth defects. From Mali to Mexico, from Uganda to the UK, consumers are being exploited by harmful financial products and abusive financial practices. It's not that we're against copyright, you know. We just want a better model. We are tackling the core problem of the consumer. Unless you tell them and you empower them to make money decisions, then we will not be able to get the kind of changes that we want. In a world of big powers, big media, little people, billions of people, we are a force for social justice. We can do it, we must, and we will. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah.